All right, good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a good day. I just wanted to give you a couple of hints on the work you had to do today. We're going to start off with number one. This takes us back to chapter five, section one. And remember, the key thing here is on mid-segments. So we know that when we have a mid-segment, we've got a couple of things that are going on. One, we know that, well, definition of a mid-segment, it's a line segment that connects two midpoints on the sides of a triangle. And we remember that we have each mid-segment, there are going to be, I'm sorry, each triangle, there are going to be three mid-segments. We've got the one, say, for instance, number one, it's drawn right here. If you find the midpoint to this side that's 48, wherever 24 is, you could have a mid-segment drawn to right here. And then you could have a third mid-segment there. So that may come into play some on this worksheet. Um, but for this problem, we're going to use one of the facts that we know about mid-segments is they're exactly half as long as the side across from it. So this 7x minus 1, if you were to double it, you get the value of 48 over here. So there's a couple ways you can set up this equation. You could set it up like doubling 7x minus 1, and that gives you 48, and solve that equation. Or you could say if I take half of 48, I get 7x minus 1. So you could say 7x minus 1 is equal to half of 48. Half of 48 is 24. Either way you solve one of these equations, you're going to get the correct answer there. Now remember, this one's just asking us to find the value of x. It doesn't actually just say to find the mid-segment. So multiplying this out, remember you need to do the distributive property there. And you get 14x minus 2 equals... 48. Add 2 to both sides, you get 14x equals 50. And then from there you're going to divide that out. It's not going to be a whole number. And I got 3.57 for my answer. should be the same thing if you took 25 and divided by 7. 3.57, that's using this equation over here, you add 1 to each side, you get 7x equals 25. And in both cases you get the same thing, which is good, that's what we want. x should be equal to 3.57. Now this one, the directions for number 5, let me pull those back up. And it says, if LR is equal to 25, find QS. So I've got LR right here, it's 25. Find the value of this QS right here. Well, remember that QS, and the directions tell you that QS is a mid-segment. Since QS is a mid-segment, it's two things in this triangle. One, it's got to be parallel to side LN, which we haven't really had to work with just yet on this worksheet. And the other thing is, it's half as long as LN. Well, if QR is a mid-segment, or if they tell you R is the midpoint, I know that 25 is half of LN. Well, so is QS, so QS must be 25. If they asked you for RN, we know RN is 25. And LN would be 50, so that would make QS half of 50. And remember, I'm not giving you all the problems here. I'm trying to move about this page. You're supposed to do all of them today. I'm giving you a few examples so that no matter where you get stuck, maybe I'm able to be there and help you out. This one says a sinkhole caused by the sudden collapse of a large section of a highway. Um, so a highway safety investigators paste out the triangle shown in the figure to help them estimate the distance across the sinkhole. What is the distance across the sinkhole? So we know that this dashed line right here is a mid-segment. How do we know that? Well, it says you got 150 here and 150 here. That means this point right here is the midpoint to this side of the triangle. And then over here, we've got 182 and 182. So this point is the midpoint to this side of the triangle. That makes this dashed line a mid-segment. So what do we know about it? It's got to be parallel to this side right here. And it's got to be half as long as 280. So 280 divided by 2 gives you 140 feet here. For that dashed line. Five dash two. 
So looking at this, it says find the value of x for number 9. I'm not going to do all these. I'm just going to actually just do number 9 for you. I know that if you look at this right here, I've got two angles that are congruent down at the bottom. That's angle ADB and angle CDB. I've got G, well not G, whatever this point is right here, um, or you could say BD is bisecting AC. And then I've got a right angle right here. That tells me that ADC must be a right triangle, triangle ADC. So that tells me 2x is congruent to x plus 2. So 2x, uh, 2x, but 2x minus 3 is equal to x plus 2. Add 3 to both sides. You get 2x equals x plus 5. Subtract x, and you get x is equal to 5 there. And you can substitute that and check it in. In fact, you're going to have to do that for number 10 there. I'll let you do that. Very similar situation going on up here with number 11 and number 12. I'll let you figure that one out. Um, of course, I'm not going to let you get through a chapter now without doing a proof. Um, there's two proofs on this. I'm going to do one of them for you. This one says, given AP is congruent to AQ. Is that drawn on here? It is. AP and AQ. BP and BQ right here. And then CP and CQ. Now notice we're dealing with three isosceles triangles here. We're trying to prove that these are collinear. And I'm not going to be super strict on whether you get some of these theorems. Sometimes we have proof like this one. It's kind of random. We're not going to use the reasonings on these a whole lot, so I'm not going to be super strict if you don't put it down exact, but I want you to do your best effort on these proofs. Um, I like the calligraphy here. So we've got statements and reasons. And so we're going to go ahead and write out our given. And you might be thinking, I think he's getting ahead of himself, and I am actually. Um, there are a couple of things I forgot to do before I start this proof. One is to write down I heart proofs, because that's very important to keep a positive attitude with proofs. The second thing is actually to develop a plan. So when I'm looking at this, I see that I've got three isosceles triangles here, and I want to prove that I can draw a line through C, B, and A. Remember, all lines in math are straight. It's not going to be curving or anything. So remember what collinear mean. They all lie, or they can all be contained by the same line. So remember that if a point is equal distant from two endpoints, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector. So I know that C is on the perpendicular bisector of triangle PCQ. B right here is also equal distant from P and Q. So I know it must be on the perpendicular bisector, which by the way is the same line. And then A is also equal distant from PQ, so it must be on the perpendicular bisector. Since all three lie on the perpendicular bisector of PQ, I know they're all collinear. So that's my plan in this proof, and that's why man, I went ahead and wrote down the given. We're going to start with PC being congruent to CQ. What's that tell me? It says C is equal distant from, let's see here, this is going to be from PQ. Actually, we should probably, because that looks like it's going to be a line segment, I should probably write that as point P and point Q. Right. You can say the same thing over here for um, B and A. So I'm going to pause the video, make it a little bit faster, and then write that out.
All right, well, I realized I didn't hit pause, but that's okay. You got to see me write it out. Sorry, I was trying to save you a little bit of time. Um, but I know I've got C is equal distant from P and Q, B is equal distant from P and Q, A is equal distant from P and Q, and all of these are just definition of equal distant here. So I know that all three points now are equal distant. I'm going to put that all in one sum there, like all in one line, I mean. And then now I can say, hey, if they're all equal distant, then that tells me that they're on the perpendicular bisector. So I can say C, B, and A lie on the perpendicular bisector. of PQ. And over here we can write just the theorem out. If you don't remember the theorem name, just write out the theorem. So say if a point is equal distant If a point is equal distant from two points, it lies on the perpendicular bisector. And we're almost done here, so now I've established that A, B, and C in the proof all lie on the perpendicular bisector. And so, since they're all the same, the perpendicular bisector of PQ, there's only one bisector, perpendicular bisector PQ. We can say that C, B, and A are collinear. And my reason be they're all on same bisector. All right, so this isn't the typical proof we're used to seeing recently where we've been proving triangles congruent, proving triangles congruent and all that. This kind of gives you something different. We're not just using SAS or anything like that. So hopefully this kind of makes it a little bit easier because we're not we're doing something different besides just congruent triangles and hopefully they give you enough guidance to help you through number 14 as well. I want to see a good, honest effort on number 14, and obviously you should have something like this written down because I'm giving you the answer on that one. All right, let's look at number 40 through 42 here. I'll do number 40. It says, can a triangle have the sides with the given lengths explained? Remember what we did with the pasta noodles in class. We said that if two sides of a triangle, you give any two sides in the triangle, they have to add up to be larger than the third. So when I check this, if you want, you can just go through each combination. I could add two and three, I could add three and five, or I could add five and two. Two plus three, is two plus three bigger than five? Well, two plus three is equal to five. Is that bigger than five? No, it's not. So I can actually stop right there. I know number 40 cannot be a triangle. Um, three plus five, that's eight. Let's suppose that did work. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 is bigger than 2. 5 plus 2 is 7. 7 is bigger than 3. The problem is all you need is 1 not to work and it can't be a triangle. So it has to add up to be something larger than the third side. I'll let you try out 41 and 42 on your own. Number 43 here says list the sides of each triangle in order from the shortest to the longest. So here's a question where we've on these, they're giving you two angles, you got to figure out the third. So we know that if we take 180 and subtract 82 from it, I'll be given 98. Subtract 44 from that, and you get 54. So this angle up top is 54. And always keep in mind what they're asking for, because sometimes they'll say go longest to shortest, sometimes they'll say shortest to longest. Here they're saying shortest to longest. So start with the shortest angle, or the shortest size we're wanting. And remember, it's always across from the smallest angle. 54, is the sm no, 54 isn't the smallest angle. A little late at night while I'm recording this. 44 is the smallest angle. 
So the side across from it is going to be NR. And then I always like to jump to the largest. The largest is going to be my last one listed. Well, the biggest angle is 82. Across from it is NS, so that goes last. And then the one in the middle is going to be across from 54. RS is going to go in the middle. That's the medium size, size one. I'll let you do 44 and 45 on your own. All right, number 46, 46 it says um, in triangle PQR, the measure of P is 55, Q is 82, and R is 43. List the sides of the triangle in order from shortest to longest. Um, once again, you can do that, but you need to draw your own triangle. So you'll need to draw out the triangle and put your angles in there and label them. And you can, you can do that. It's just like the last one. You just have to draw it. Um, same thing for number 47. You have to draw out triangle MNS, label your sides, and then you're going to use the converse of what we just did to figure out which angles are um, the smallest and, and then label them from smallest to largest. Um, 48, we've done a couple of these in class. If you're drawing it out, we know 1 is 8 and 1 is 17. This is x. What are the possible values for x here? So x has to be less than something and then greater than something. This goes back to when we worked with the pasta noodles. Okay, So I want you to try that one out as well. Look back in your homework to get a little extra help there. Number 49, it says write inequality relating the given side lengths. If there's not enough information to reach a conclusion, write no conclusion. We did some of these yesterday. This is all going back to the hinge theorem. So remember with the hinge theorem, we need to have two sides congruent. I've got this side congruent to this side. I've got this side right here, YZ, is going to be congruent to BC right there. So I've got two congruent. Now you look at the middle angle here, or the included angle. If they're congruent, the two triangles are congruent by side angle side. But in this case, they're not. 101 is larger than 75. So I know XZ must be greater than AC. Or in this case, you can say AC is less than XZ there. Do the same thing over here for number 50. And just take a note, right here on number 50, do you see that one arc mark here and one arc mark right there? Don't get confused. It's not saying that those angles are congruent. It's just saying like 51 is this angle and 44 is this angle. So it's not a typo there. It's just a different way of notating it on a diagram. 51, here's another one we did a, quite a few of in class. Remember that we're going to use the converse of the hinge theorem here. Since I've got 13 congruent to 13, 17 congruent to 17, I can look at these middle, the included angle, and say, which one's bigger? Well, I don't know what 5x minus 10 is, but if we use the converse of the hinge theorem, I can say, see, 18 is larger than 12. So I know that 5x minus 10 must be larger than 45. I'm going to go ahead and set this inequality up for you because the ones we did yesterday, usually the algebraic expression, that was the smaller one. Here it's the larger one. So I'm going to say that's greater than 45. So we're not doing like greater than zero like we did yesterday. So what's the maximum can this angle be? Can it be a thousand degree angle? No, it can't. It can't be like even a 200 degree angle. All three angles in a triangle have to be summed up to be less than 180. Here, um, it can be 179 degrees, and maybe this is three-fourths of a degree, and this one's one-fourth of a degree. But the key thing is it can't be 180, because that would make these two zero, and you can't have a triangle with a zero-degree angle in it. So we're going to say that it's less than 180. Anything less than 180 for, our, for what we know right now would be acceptable. All right, so solve that inequality. I think you're capable of doing that. I won't solve it for you. And then do something similar here with number 52. Set up an inequality and solve it. That one, well, I'm not going to give you any more hints on that. You can figure that one out. Number 53 says complete each with a less than or greater than, the greater than and explain your reasoning. So once again, you're going to use the hinge theorem here. Um, I don't think you should need any help with these. If you... If you made it this far, you should be good with those and use the hinge theorem on that. All right. So I'm a little jumbled up on that. I'm doing this kind of late at night. I want to get this in for you so you'd have a little bit of help. 
and hope you guys are doing well without me, and I'll see you on Monday.